Mommy, look at what, Mom. You let me play games and open presents, and I got That's this. That's nice, dear, but could you tell me about it later when my show's Thank over? Doctor, you know they're cold. Daddy, I went to Vicky's party today, and it was really a lot of fun. We all things to He had ice cream. We did. I had a little dog here. Yeah. That's nice, Susie. Do you want to know what I got? today. Children can go to the dogs when families don't listen. Listening is the beginning of understanding. Usually you know what you're looking at when making one of these videos ahead of time. When the 8-bit guy started his Commodore series, he knew he was in for a marathon, and since I'm a Generation Xer, I Omega was a definition of cool at the time the internet was becoming a thing. Much like Gateway 2000, this channel's namesake, I Omega wasn't just technologically significant, but culturally significant. It single-handedly changed the phrase, your data, to your stuff. In fact, it's safe to say that iOmega had one of, if not the most impressive product launches in history. Launching a ditto tape drive, the 1GB jazz drive, and a 100MB zip drive, all at the same time in 1994, along with an extensive advertising campaign and rebranded logo, even an accompanying fashion line with a stroke of genius not seen by the industry before. Where Apple had failed, iOmega succeeded. But Apple had copied this model over and over again on its way to a trillion dollar valuation. The envy of all peripheral manufacturers, iOmega's zip drive was so successful, the only competition were from other products developed by iOmega. But even while iOmega never strayed from its primary product, peripheral data storage, this is really the story of three companies and another silicon movement you've never heard of. So this will be the first of two parts of this piece we'll call the iOmega Effect. iOmega was one of three incredibly influential companies that sprouted up along the Wasatch Front in Utah from the years 1979 to 1980. All three enjoyed monstrous success, but not all at once. And all three were started by Mormons, had an all-Mormon workforce, and the key players were all educated at Utah universities. Now, those of you who are not from the Western U.S. probably know very little about the Church of Jesus Christ with some Latter-day Saints. Some of you might even think of it as a cult, or you might only know what you've seen on South Park. But for years, the church has produced some of the most successful business professionals in the U.S., most notably J.W. Marriott, who started the world's largest hotel chain. Look for that Book of Mormon in a nightstand next time you stay at a Marriott. But this sort of synergistic business event has never happened before or since. Imagine if HP, Intel, and Adobe all started in Palo Alto within a year of each other. The other two companies were Novell and Word Perfect Corporation. So let's talk about those two other companies for a moment. WordPerfect was the second killer DOS app. The first was Lotus 123, a spreadsheet program that essentially ruthlessly copied the unprotected VisiCalc, which had been developed on and primarily for CPM. For over a decade, WordPerfect became the only word processor anyone wanted and all corporate America used. WordStar had essentially been written and promoted by two guys, both geniuses to be sure, but with no business acumen whatsoever. It was bundled with the popular Osborne and K-Pro machines back in 1985, but had not been copy-protected, and most people suspected this was intentional, so competitive products such as Broderbund's Bank Street Rider could never catch a foothold. It seemed as though the rest of the world was waiting for GUI and WYSIWYG, and this was a good reason, as makers of CPM were known to be almost done with a GUI called GEM. But no one was willing to put an entire, organized, well-funded company behind just a word processor. This is an insane notion when you consider that close to 80% of everything done in the computer then was word processing. As WordStar began collapsing under its relatively small weight, it was clear that even without any real competition, it could not continue to carry this giant portion of the industry. So WordPerfect was set up a lot like a modern web browser. It was a simple base program that allowed for robust plugins to be developed by hundreds of software companies for the hundreds of niche industries that existed. All of this could run on the DOS operating system with a minimal amount of RAM and storage for under $400, which at the time was the killer application pricing sweet spot. WordPerfect had to wait a few years for DOS to catch up, but once it did, there was simply no competition until Microsoft Word 6.0 would come out years later. There was no WYSIWYG or any real font choices, but there was an ingenious feature called Reveal Codes, which would let you concentrate on your writing at the top of the screen, while seeing how the software intended to display the output at the bottom. Also, WordPerfect never released a spreadsheet or database component like all of its competitors did, which had the effect of devaluing their core product. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe, and with me today is Janiel Miller of WordPerfect Corporation. Janiel, you have the Macintosh version of WordPerfect up here, and you're going to tell me I can run full motion videos in a WordPerfect document? That's right. WordPerfect for the Macintosh is System 7 Savvy. So that so was the application side. 
with the second biggest but most lucrative application software release. Novell, the second company on the silicon front, released a network operating system that combined all the network security and flexibility of a mainframe on a peer-to-peer network. Novell was and is still loved by almost every IT professional industry. Heard of Active Directory? That was Novell. How about mapping and subdividing remote drives with a drive letter on your computer? That was Novell too. How about multi-layer network security? Novell. How about networking mixed OS or networking type environments? Novell. So even though Microsoft would make the biggest OS, without Novell it could only live in a single computer at any given time, and Novell was just as dominant and remained that way for a decade. Much to the chagrin of a hairy Bill Gates who would never really be able to kill Novell off for 20 years. I'm a PC. And I'm Linux. Well, well, fancy pants. New outfits, huh? Yeah, I figured I'd give myself a new look. I call this Vista Leopard. Oh, thank you. Ooh, fits nicely. Uh, what, what's that? I keep up with the latest trends. And people just share that stuff with you? All the time. Wish I had a jacket like that. I might work on you. I'll probably wear this for another six or seven years. Vinyl? Pleather. Nice. So now we have the biggest single application and the biggest network operating system. And now under iOmega, who would eventually become the dominant memory storage company, even beating out rivals like Seagate and Western Digital without even making primary storage. But unlike WordPerfect and Novell, iOmega would have a roaring start, several near deaths in the comeback of the century. So maybe we can come back and talk about the Silicon Front later, but for now, let's focus on iOmega. In order to tell you the story of iOmega, you have to go back, way back before computer monitors ever existed. In 1950s America, administrative workers moved business slowly and deliberately by hand. Pneumatic tubes and couriers would move documents from place to place. Everything was carried by hand and created on paper. Massive filing systems would house the millions of pieces of paper created by business all the time. If you needed to close a big real estate deal, there was no way to electronically send money or by any guaranteed method. So instead, you'd send a guy with a suitcase full of money attached to his wrist with a handcuff. Airlines reserved seats with models and wooden blocks. No credit cards existed because no one borrowed money. And even if you bought a car, you were expected to put 40 to 50% down. In this environment, big business was discouraged. The best way to increase efficiency was to do business with only people you could trust to pay you. But this model was unsustainable. The U.S. population would double between the Korean and Vietnam Wars, and the baby boomers didn't want to carry and file stuff for a living anymore. They wanted to go to college and do whatever they felt like doing for a living. Dad would sell the pharmacy to the regional pharmacy chain. The corner store would turn into Kroger or Safeway. The service station would turn into a Midas or Firestone, and everyone started shopping at Sears. Unlike what those of us who didn't live through it thought, computers did not rise and the world figured out a way to use them. The computers rose to meet the needs of the people. Big business thirsted for the ability to electronically file and communicate like a desert nomad thirsts for water. And big business was inevitable. Today we see the computer as a luxury. Even a small business might put off upgrading to save money. But in the late 60s and early 70s, computers replaced people. People are unreliable and very expensive. And there was almost no amount of money that was too much money to complete the task of a room full of people sitting in front of typewriters. IBM, Xerox, Wang, Digital Equipment Corporation, National Cash Register, and AT&T were all keenly aware of this and would make marginal improvements to speed and capacity every year. But it wasn't enough. Big companies making the technology had fallen prey to the same problems inhibiting big companies in general. The small guys made a comeback, and the best part of the story is they made it off the scraps of the big guys. Everyone knows the idea of the Macintosh was stolen from Xerox by Apple, the Microsoft Windows stolen from them. Even Steve Wozniak, inventing the original Apple, was working for HP, who didn't want the idea. And David Bailey stole a zip drive from IBM. In the mid-1970s, IBM was trying to figure out a reliable way to store data, and hard drives were not the answer. They were immovable, giant, power-hungry living disks of soft metal, which need to be created and kept clean for their entire short life. Everyone in the industry hated magnetic tape storage as a medium. Well, great for listening to your Credence album. They were slow, noisy, big, and need to be kept at a certain temperature. A roll of data tape held about the same as a five-drawer filing cabinet and took a higher-paid technician to move it around. But for programmers, this tape was still better than writing a separate application loader for each program. So the hard drive seemed to be a godsend. If you wanted to move your data around or install a program somewhere else, you'd have to take giant rolls of tape on a plane or a train. 
Since tape was never the same size or in the same enclosure, you might even have to bring the reader with you. And don't forget, there was no parallel or SCSI, so you had to figure out a way to install that device in the other computer. The first version of a small mechanical storage device was called a Winchester drive, and these drives cost a fortune. When the power went out, you would lose all your data and they'd need to be replaced. As the 1970s rolled into the 80s, hard drives got better and better. A standard interface called MFM came into being. So the stage was set. No tape, all mechanical, wait for the better and hope for the best. It was in this environment that IBM abandoned its genius 8-inch multi-platter portable data storage cartridge. This was supposed to be a companion to the IBM 5100 series computer, been at the same North Carolina factory that made its famous Model M keyboard, but the computer was abandoned in favor of the Boca Raton model that would eventually become the IBM PC. David Bailey had been at the IBM Tucson facility for some time and tried to convince IBM to market the device as a peripheral, but it was no dice. So frustrated David, frustrated David Bailey took his show on the road. With the idea of patenting the drive, he looked for capital and finally finding it from a Texas family who put a little under $5 million into the idea. Like the other big Wasatch 3, his company was entirely comprised of Mormons. This actually proved to be a problem for Bailey when he had to get a second round of capital. He was asked what non-Mormon employees thought the experience was of working at iOmega. He couldn't find one out. The Bernoulli Principle. The product is based around a 200-year-old concept developed by Daniel Bernoulli, the Swiss mathematician who taught us how to fly airplanes, make curveballs curve, sailboats sail. The same principles apply to the way we manage the diskette interface to the reading and writing device, the head. Uh, having accomplished this technical breakthrough, the thing that is available to the user is transportability of a high capacity cartridge, 10 megabytes or 20 megabytes. When newly drive and the media were ready almost right away, iOmega still had to design a system to convert the data into a format computers of the day would understand. This meant that they had to develop a chip, a process known as VLSI. This took a long time and was almost unheard of feat for any small company, and they got it right the first time. Whether this could be attributed to luck or skill, that almost never worked out that way. Atari and Commodore were constantly getting caught up in this stage. Had SCSI existed, it would have been easy, but SCSI wouldn't come around until 1985, and by early 1983, they had secured a patent and were ready to begin production. Late 83 set a first unit ship. The drive itself is $5,000 in today's dollars and about $200 for a 5 megabyte disk. David Bailey had both a product and a philosophy, both equally important to the success of iOmega. He felt the work generated on a personal computer ought to belong to the person generating it and not the computer. He knew that when people saw an opportunity to take their work with them when they left the desk, his product would sell. Sales in 1983 came in at about $2.5 million, and within two years, we've grown over 10 times that number. The Bernoulli Box is a darling of the 1985 Comdex in Las Vegas, and the press, especially the New York Times, loved it too. Bailey's philosophy resonated with the public. Since the PC market became saturated in 1987, and the IBM AT came with a standard hard drive, all the clone makers followed suit. This relegated the Bernoulli Box to a backup medium, moving it from the mainstream to a niche market. IOMega struggled the next five years. Executives came and went, and with them all the profits. By the end of the decade, IOMega could only show 40000 in earnings and almost $40 million in sales. Having gone public meant their struggles were for the world to see. So IOMega joined a consortium of companies jointly sharing the development costs of technology called Floptical Drive. This would eventually become the Super Drive or LS120. This is a standard magnetic disk with a more precise laser-guided propagation and retrieval technique. The drive was pricey, the media was hard to come by, and iOmega continued to struggle. Not to mention the fact that it may have been the biggest step backward in speed since the magnetic tape itself. A new CEO breathed life into the company, and now with over 2,000 employees and manufacturing in nearby Orem, he dumped millions into marketing, market research, and brand development. Within a couple of years, iOmega would launch three successful products. The Ditto drive was a tape backup drive used patent, using patented 3M cassettes and cost very little. The Jazz Drive utilized SCSI interface to write up to one gigabyte of data on a single cartridge. The speeds of these drives is only a little bit slower than conventional hard drives of the day, and faster than some of the cheaper ones. And of course, the Zip Drive. With 25 and 100 megabyte disks and a price of under $200, this device would prove to be one of the most loved and hated devices by the end of the 90s. But everyone bought one. Starting at $199, but quickly dropping to $149 just in time for Christmas, 
Slow, but far better than anyone else had ever seen. The parallel zip drive was great, but the Atapi internal zip drive ran close to hard drive speeds and quickly became an available or included option on tons of consumer PCs. iOmega also opened up zip drive manufacturing to its flopsical partners, meaning several companies would provide the media and compete, lowering pricing and increasing availability. All this was great except for two essential problems. When the Bernoulli drive first came out, there were two competitors. First were static memory cards, like a tiny SSD, and the other were Winchester drives. So the first issue was a technology which could not compete in 1983, but would get better. The second issue was that every technology company had to deal with in the 90s, consumer expectations. So let's take a look at two companies, Gateway 2000 and AOL. In the early 90s, both of these names had stellar reputations for quality and customer service. In 1993, Gateway shipped its millionth PC and needed to expand their customer base to continue to grow. Like you saw with AST in the last episode, the natural place to look for customers was in a highly profitable enterprise sector. And that's where Gateway started. State and local governments and educational customers made up a third of Gateway sales, and they had made inroads into various verticals in the business world. But in order to compete with the corp- in the corporate sector, they had to carry a full line of machines that didn't change often so companies could support them easily. This meant that they were expensive and completely separate product in every way from their core. If Gateway intended to make an enterprise customer their customer, they would have to take fat cats out for dinner and hire an enterprise sales force that traveled all the time. With the average selling price of over $3,000 per unit and a gross margin exceeding 25%, this is a no-brainer. There's plenty of meat on the bone for these enterprise customers and their support costs would be much lower after the sale. But as the direct build market was becoming saturated in 1996, Gateway had to get more customers faster as sales were dropping. Cue the country store. And as they sold deeper and deeper into the consumer market, profits margins eroded. And those fat cats still wanted more dinners. Worse, Gateway brought its first-time users to the market and support costs skyrocketed. And the deeper they went, the lower the margins and the less understanding those customers were. They did not understand why their Windows 98 PC was not as reliable as a refrigerator or color TV. And now there was no more money for the fat cats to eat, and the store overhead was too high. Quick fixes like providing their own financing to people who rarely paid their bills anyway just made things worse, and the executives installed by nervous stockholders would cannibalize the company to temporarily boost stock prices. In the end, Gateway had a reputation of selling overpriced junk to low-end consumers. Cutest cow-spotted curtains. AOL had fantastic product everyone wanted, but again... New users skyrocketed support costs, and assuming a dollar figure for revenue from each subscriber, assumed they stayed a subscriber. So AOL started to offer rebates and basically give the end user the computer to get a loyal subscriber, but again, from people who rarely paid their bills anyway. In the meantime, they needed more and more backend infrastructure to meet demands of the ever less profitable, disloyal, and often angry customer. So the most profitable customers took their ladders and left the walled garden, leaving the customers chatting in chat rooms between episodes of Cops and Jerry Springer. And iOmega would fall into the same trap. The Bernoulli drive was essentially a power user enterprise device, as were the Jazz and Ditto drives. But the Zip drive ended up everywhere and used by everyone. Those people didn't understand why some of their discs would fail. They didn't care that the same drive they got for $149.99 would have, cost, would have leased from IBM for $5,000 a month 15 years before. The click of death, which would permanently scar iOmega's reputation and result in a class action lawsuit, which iOmega settled by offering rebates, really didn't bother the customers that were the profitable ones. After all, they knew you got what you paid for. So even after sales sales passed even the most optimistic predictions, where was the next iOmega hula hoop? USB was just around the corner, and the mainstream interface, the cost of per megabyte storage, was dropping annually by about half. Gone was the enterprise customer, the power user, the early adopters, iOmega took 15 years to go with the zip drive, and that are expected to come out with something just as groundbreaking every couple years. By 1998, iOmega was again tearing on the brink of bankruptcy, and their new idea, the click, was not selling well and had poor retail support. The USB thumb drive would render almost all products that had made to that point irrelevant, even as the zip drives got as big as three quarters of a gig. CD burners, MP3 players, and other products in the market were just were just a C of similar and identi- identical products. And unlike HP, who could leverage their dealers to carry anything new it chose to produce against its printers, which were dominant, I only get only one type of peripheral, selling into a matured and saturated market. In 2002, they closed their domestic manufacturing in Utah and moved to San Diego, 
essentially just to become a name brand as they waited to die. Three years later, Lenovo, which had recently acquired half the suburb, a suburban Boston company, which made enterprise storage equipment, wrote a check for $250 million and just took the name. So more Not a bad deal under the circumstances, but it essentially kill the soul of a once great and innovative company that iOmega was. So let's recap. Let's look at the pricing of data or, or your stuff storage during the period we've looked at today. So in uh, 1980, you could buy a static memory card for your computer. 128K would run about $1,200. Just two years later, you'd get a 20 megabyte hard drive for just $4,500. That's $2,018, of course. The next year, you could get the little cartridge, mm, unlimited storage, 15 megabytes at a time for just $3,500. Late 83, set a first Bernoulli box. Eight inches of nearly undestructible 20 megabyte storage for that low $3,500 price. The Box 2 in 1987 cut that size and cost nearly in half. The first home computer tape backup drive of any note came out that year. In 1991 came the last Bernoulli incarnation. They finally took the box out of the name. The Floptical at 80 megabytes followed up by the LS120 would, give, would use a laser to give you carnivorous floppy storage seeking at the speed of a Sherpa. 94 saw the iOmega Big 3, followed by their CRW, CDRW in 1995. 96 brought an improved and upgraded versions of all your iOmega stuff, along with the Rev, the last mechanical iOmega release. By 98, iOmega had committed to the CDRW format, introducing the amazingly fast Predator drive. The 80 megabyte clip drive was also an early SD-like incarnation. And today, you can go to Micro Center and get a very fast 32,000 megabyte self-contained drive for about 350. So we go from $9,600 to one one thousandth of a cent per megabyte. Hard drive pricing took an even more dramatic dive. Starting with 15 megabyte TRS-80 drive in 1982 for $166 a megabyte to one one hundred thousandth of a cent today. Next time, we'll take a closer look at iOmega's products and all the ways you can introduce, inter, integrate them with your PC. We'll also look at Bernoulli Box, Zip, Jazz, Ditto Drive, and install them into vintage PCs. I hope you've enjoyed this episode, and be sure to subscribe.